السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته To carry on with the anatomy of the thorax I'm gonna discuss in this presentation the anatomy of the heart I'm Dr. Dadia Saleh, professor and head of anatomy department at Mansoura University, Egypt The objectives of my presentation will be First I'm gonna talk about the pericardium It's forming layers and it's a sinuses then I'm going to discuss the external features of the heart, its surfaces and borders, and the outflow tract of the heart, uh, which includes the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. Then I'm going to discuss the internal features of the heart and how the atrium looks from inside and also the ventricles, and finally the heart valves. Before we study the anatomy of the heart, we need to know where the heart is located in our body. So try to forget your imagination about the heart that it looks like this, or that it is placed in the left side of your chest. In real life, the heart is almost located in the middle of the chest, slightly to the left of the midline, and lies superior to the diaphragm. In a side view, the heart almost fills the space between the sternum anteriorly and the vertebral column posteriorly. And since it lies above the diaphragm, it can move up and down during respiration with the movement of the diaphragm. So in expiration, the diaphragm moves upward and also the heart. And with inspiration, the diaphragm moves downward and the heart also moves downward with it. If we want to look at the heart in its normal position inside the thoracic cavity, so let's take a look at this diagram. This is the sternum in the midline, and this is the costal margin. This is the diaphragm. And you can see the two lungs filling the lateral sides of the thoracic cage. And actually, you cannot see the heart because it is covered by the two lungs, except at this small area that appears from uh, the pericardial covering of the heart because of the retraction of the uh, anterior border of the left lung. We call this area the cardiac notch. If we remove the lungs, you can see that uh, the heart fills the middle partition between uh, these two lungs. We call this partition the mediastinum. Again, you can see that the heart rests on the diaphragm below, and the superior aspect of the heart, the big vessels, get out of the heart like the aorta and the pulmonary trunk and also the entrance of the superior vena cava here and these big vessels fill almost the same space that is occupied by the heart if we take a section in the heart to see the layers forming its wall we have an outermost layer we call it the epicardium made of the visceral pericardium a middle thick layer it's called myocardium formed by the cardiac muscle and an inner lining called endocardium. The first layer that covers the heart from outside is made of fibrous tissue. We call it the fibrous pericardium. Peri means around and the cardium means heart. Inside this fibrous pericardium lies a serous sac called serous pericardium. It's folded upon itself into two layers. The inner layer lies uh, close to the heart surface. It is called the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. And an outer layer that lines the fibrous pericardium from inside, it is called the parietal layer of serous pericardium. The space between the visceral layer and the parietal layer is called the pericardial space. So in order to imagine these two layers, think of the heart as your fist and the serous pericardium as an inflated balloon and you are pressing your fist on this balloon from one side so what will happen the skin of the balloon that lies close to your fist resembles the visceral layer of serous pericardium while the outer skin of the balloon resembles the parietal layer of the serous pericardium and the space between these two layers will resemble the pericardial space in this sagittal section of the heart, you can see this is the anterior surface related to the sternum. And this is the diaphragm here. And this is the inferior surface of the heart resting on the diaphragm. 
we can notice the pericardial space surrounding the heart and there is a subdivision of this pericardial space called the transverse sinus of the pericardium. It lies posterior to the aorta and the pulmonary trunk and anterior to the superior vena cava and superior to the left atrium of the heart. It is better to see it in this view. You can notice that um, this is the pericardial space after removal of the heart completely, leaving only the big vessels entering the heart like the superior and inferior vena cava and the four pulmonary veins, the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So the location of the transverse sinus will be here. It lies posterior to the aorta and the pulmonary trunk and anterior to the superior vena cava and superior to the left atrium and the pulmonary veins. If we put the chambers of the heart in their place again, between the four pulmonary veins, here will be the location of the left atrium. Between the superior and the inferior vena cava, the right atrium will be here. And the two ventricles lies anterior to the two atria. So the oblique sinus is an extension or subdivision of the pericardial sac that is found behind the heart. So in order to see it well, we need to remove the chambers again. So we will remove the two ventricles, the right atrium and the left atrium. And let's see now the boundary of the oblique sinus. It is surrounded by a reflection of serous pericardium around the right and left pulmonary veins and the inferior vena cava. Now let's talk about the heart and let's start again with the normal orientation of the heart and the body. So forget about uh, this simple diagram that you can see in almost uh, all physiology lectures that shows you the four chambers of the heart, the two atria above and the two ventricles below. So looking at this uh, diagram you may think that the atria lies superior to the ventricles and the blood passes from the atria to the ventricle in a downward direction. Actually, the atria are not found superior to the ventricles, but actually they lie posterior or behind the ventricles. So in this real specimen or real picture of the heart, these are the two ventricles, the right ventricle and the left ventricle, and posterior to these ventricles lies the two atria. In order to see them, we have to rotate the heart like this to look at its back so we can see the right atrium here and uh, this is the entrance of the superior and the inferior vena cava and to its left lies the left atrium with the entrance of the two superior and the inferior right pulmonary veins and here the entrance of the superior and the inferior left pulmonary veins. So in this diagram, we can see the orientation of the heart again. If you are looking to the heart from the front, you're going to see mostly the ventricles, especially the right ventricle, because the heart rotates upon itself in a clockwise direction. So if you're looking from the front, you can see the right ventricle and the part of the left ventricle. But if we rotate the heart and look at the back, we can see mainly the left atrium and to its right lies part of the right atrium. So regarding the external features of the heart, it is roughly pyramidal in shape or cone shaped. Its apex is the blunt rounded end of the heart and corresponds to the tip of the pyramid. It's formed mainly by the left ventricle and directed anteriorly, inferiorly and to the left. The heart has three surfaces. Sternocostal surface or anterior surface, it is named sternocostal surface because it faces the sternum and the costal cartilages of the thoracic wall. And in this surface you can see the four chambers of the heart. This extension of the right atrium called the right auricle, left auricle, left ventricle and right ventricle. Its interior or diaphragmatic surface, it's called like this because it rests on the diaphragm. We can see the left ventricle makes like two thirds of this surface and the remaining one third is made by the right ventricle. 
The third surface is called the posterior surface or the base of the heart. It is named the base of the heart because it lies opposite to the apex and it is formed mainly by the left atrium and to the right of it lies part of the right atrium. Also we have three borders forming the heart. The right border is made by the superior vena cava, the right atrium and the inferior vena cava. The inferior border of the heart is made by the right ventricle and it separates the sternocostal surface from the diaphragmatic surface. The left border of the heart is formed by the following structures from superior to inferior, the aorta, pulmonary trunk, the left auricle, the left ventricle, and the apex of the heart. If we look at the roots of the pulmonary trunk in these two views, in this anterior view, you can see that the pulmonary trunk arises from the right ventricle. It lies to the left of the ascending aorta and then moves backwards to split into two branches, right pulmonary artery and left pulmonary artery. The right pulmonary artery will pass posterior to the ascending aorta and posterior to the superior vena cava and superior to the left atrium and the right superior pulmonary vein. The root of the aorta arises from the left ventricle and goes upward covered at its beginning by the right auricle. It lies to the left of the superior vena cava and to the right of the pulmonary trunk and then arches superior to the pulmonary trunk to form the arch of the aorta. Now if we look at the right atrium from inside and we have a cut section in its anterior wall, we're gonna see an extension of it that covers the root of the aorta, it is called the right auricle and the right auricle develops embryologically from the heart tube, that's why its wall is made of rough muscles called the pectinate muscles or musculi pectinati and this differs from the posterior wall of the right atrium which is smooth thus it is called sinus venarum and this area embryologically develops from the sinus venosus the demarcation between the musculi pectinati and the sinus venarum is called crista terminalis if it is seen from inside or sulcus terminalis if it is seen from outside Here we can see the interatrial septum that separates the right atrium from the left atrium and we can see the remnants of the foramen ovale, here it is called fossa ovalis and it is surrounded by a border, this border is called lampus of fossa ovalis. Also we can see the opening of the superior vena cava, the opening of the inferior vena cava and another opening for the coronary sinus that drains the venous return from the heart itself. It lies between the inferior vena cava opening and the tricuspid opening. The inside of the left atrium is almost featureless, so it is formed of the left auricle. Also it contains musculi bictinati and we can see the interatrial septum from the left side and here is the remnant of the fossa ovalis can be seen as well. In a real specimen, this is the right atrium from inside. Here you can see the opening of the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava opening here, the coronary sinus opening here, and this is the interatrial septum. This is the fossa ovalis surrounded by the lumbus of the fossa ovalis. And here is the left atrium from inside. You can see the interatrial septum from its left side. And this depression represents the remnants of the closed foramen of air. If we look to the right ventricle from inside, we are going to see the opening of the tricuspid valve surrounded by three cusps. We also can notice cone-shaped muscles extending uh, from the wall of the right ventricle. These are called Pillary muscles, we have three groups of them, anterior, posterior and septal as well. Their base is attached to the wall of the ventricle while their apex is attached to 
tendon-like cords. They are called cordy tendini. They are attached from one end to the papillary muscles and from the other end to the edges of the cusps of the tricuspid valve. And when the ventricle contracts, it prevents the tricuspid valve to prolapse into the atrium. Also, there are roughness or irregularity in the wall of the right ventricle. We call it tropically horny. One of them is prominent. We call it the septomarginal or moderator band. And it's a significance that the right bundle branch of the conducting system of the heart travels through this moderator band. The upper part of the right ventricle is called infundibulum, and unlike the rest of the right ventricle wall, it is smooth, and this is the outflow part of the right ventricle. It lies just below the pulmonary orifice, which is guarded by the pulmonary valve. We can also notice the interventricular septum that lies between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. Its lower part is muscular, while its upper part is membranous. If we look at this real heart, and this is the right ventricle open, here we can see the papillary muscles, the cordy tendony, the infundibulum of the right ventricle, and the pulmonary orifice. The inside of the left ventricle doesn't differ much from that of the right ventricle, except that it has much thicker wool than the right ventricle. Here, the valve that separates the left atrium from the left ventricle is called the bicuspid valve or the mitral valve. It's made of two cusps, anterior and posterior. At the base of the left ventricle, there is uh, two groups of uh, papillary muscles, anterior group and posterior group. They give attachment to the cordy tendony that are attached as well to the cusps of the mitral valve and they prevent the prolapse of the mitral valve back into the left atrium during left ventricular systole. The wall of the left ventricle also contains irregularity and the myocardium is called tropically carny and the outflow part of the left ventricle is called the aortic vestibule. It's not seen here in this section. It lies just below the aortic orifice, which is guarded by the aortic valve. In this real specimen, we can see the mitral valve, the papillary muscles, the cordy tendony, the aortic vestibule, which leads upward to the aorta. In this real specimen, we can see a cross section in the two ventricles. You can see the papillary muscles from below and the cordy tendony and the cusps of the mitral valve here. Notice that the left ventricle in cross section is circular in shape while the right ventricle is C-shaped. And this is the interventricular septum which looks like the letter C as well. Also notice the marked difference in the thickness of the left ventricle and the right ventricle. The left ventricle thickness is almost three times that of the right ventricle. Now how the blood flows inside the heart. In the right side, non-oxygenated blood returns to the heart through the superior and the inferior vena cava. From there, it passes to the right atrium. Then, when the right atrium contracts, it pushes the blood through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle and the blood here passes forward towards the right ventricle. Remember that the right atrium lies behind the right ventricle. And then from the right ventricle during systole, the blood is pushed upward and to the left to lead the right ventricle through the pulmonary valve towards the pulmonary trunk. The blood flow in the left side. Oxygenated blood returns to the left atrium by the four pulmonary veins. We have two on the left side and two on the right side. And then blood passes through the mitral valve from the left atrium directly forward to the left ventricle. And then blood makes a U-turn and moves upward and to the right to leave the heart through the aortic opening.
So the valves of the heart will have two types of valves inside the heart that keep the blood flowing in one direction. The first type of valves are called the atrioventricular valves or cuspid valves. They lie between the two atria and the two ventricles. The other type of valves are called the semilunar valves and they are found at the root of the big vessels that leave the ventricles. So if we take an example of the cuspid valve, this is the tricuspid valve and this is how it looks like. It's made of three cusps here. It opens to allow the blood to pass from the right atrium to the right ventricle and then closes during right ventricular systole and the cusps meet each other in an irregular line. Of course, the cordy tendony prevents its prolapse in the right atrium. This is the root of the pulmonary trunk and of the aorta and you can see the shape of the semilunar valves. This is the pulmonary valve for example seen from above. It opens to allow the blood to pass from the right ventricle to the pulmonary trunk and closes again to prevent regurgitation of the blood. Now this is the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening and if you like it, please do not forget to subscribe, like and share.